you're thinking about research, get your team together, get your group together and say, you know what? I'm thinking about research, but really I'm, we're here today for something else. That is, I want to ask you to think about what are the questions that are on your mind that if we did research would be worth asking. Mm -hmm. Think through the questions. You will whet people's appetites. You'll get a process going. People will say, gee, I'd really love to know that. Would you be interested in working on the project to get at that? Absolutely. So that's really a good way to get, to get the research process going. Mark Trencher from Nishma Research, thank you so much for joining me here on Mind Your Business. Yeah, thank you so much, Yusuk. It's a pleasure joining you. Thank you. Um, let's start broadly. Uh, market research is a is a big topic. Of course, it, it it interrelates with the world of marketing and advertising very, very much so, as we know. Perhaps you could just, for the audience, s you know, spell it out. What is that term, market research? Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. So, of course, people can take a full semester or even multiple semesters on research in college. People can take uh, uh, semesters on buy in statistics, statistical analysis. It's all part of market research. Before I get into what market research is, I just want to back it up a little bit sure. and point out that really what market research is broadly is a set of tools that help you find the answers to important questions. For me, the key has always been the questions even more than the answers sometimes. So uh, before I get into some of the different kinds of research, let me just give you examples of the kinds of questions that people should be asking. By people, I mean um, businesses, small businesses, large businesses, uh, communal organizations. Uh, so, so the first uh, question that often comes to mind is uh, deals with the topic of awareness. Do people know that I'm around? I have a business, I have a hardware store, uh, in Flatbush, Brooklyn, hmm. do people even know I'm there? Do people how do how do people find out about me? Uh, in the old days, it was the yellow pages. So now, how do people find out? Uh, looking it up in a newspaper, word of mouth, and how much do they know about me? If I specialize, if I have certain specialties, do people know that? Yeah, I've got a niche in this particular area, and also in in the area of awareness, um, do people have any impression of me? compared to my competitors, compared to the store that's four blocks away. So this is, these are just all questions dealing with awareness, the sense that people have of businesses and of organizations. A, a very big topic where people ask questions these days, I would say more than anything else is the area of customer satisfaction, customer relationship. Are my customers happy? You can't go to the doctor without getting an email saying, rate us on a scale of one to five. What they do is that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, are my customers happy? Why are they happy? Why are they not happy? Um, if somebody asked my customer, would, would you recommend this business or this organization or this doctor's office or whatever, what would you say? Would you say yes or no? So the whole area of customer satisfaction, which also relates to being a like repeat customers, because a lot of the customer satisfaction relates to will they come back again. Uh, an area that I find very interesting and important is the area of importance. So I did a survey, for, uh, I, I was approached by an organization, it was actually a synagogue, a shul, that said, we did a survey and we know people think we're doing a great job on A and a great job on B and not such a good job on C. And I said, okay, uh, which of those are more important, which are less important? They had to admit that they never really asked their members what they found more important. Is it more, are programs for senior citizens more important than programs for the, for the, te for the teens? So to me, uh, the, the questions about the importance, how important are things to my, to my customers? If I'm a business, how important is price? It could be very important. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the speed of service is more important. Sometimes just the friendliness of the staff, being able to go, to go into a store or an office or call somebody on the phone and get advice is important. It could be the variety of products. They're looking for variety. It could be technology. I really need to deal with somebody who has a good website. So uh, another area that's important is this whole area of what's important. Um, I'll, I'll give one more example as to kind sure. of question. These are all these are all examples of questions people should be asking even before you start to think about it. You're going to do a survey or interviews. Questions to ask. Uh, I have an idea for a product, and this is actually an example that recently happened to me. I'll go through it a little bit later. But I have an idea for a product. Um, I'm just wondering, you know. How big is the mar is the market out there? Who exactly is in the market? Market sizing. Who falls into that market? Right. Market sizing. 
what what would they think of my idea? How can I get to talk to them to get ideas to tweak my idea? How much are they willing to pay? So these are all examples of questions. And to me, the first step always is thinking through the questions that you want to ask. Mark, um, something that's definitely going on in some people's minds right now is like, hey, how do I get in touch with this Mark? <laughs> I have an idea. I have a product. You know, I realize I really should be in touch with someone like that. Before I go to a commercial break, how what heck can people find out more about your uh, amazing okay. work? So very briefly, I'm, I'm retired. As you mentioned, just like I was in the business world, I did a lot of research in business. Um, when I retired in 2015, I set up a practice. So right now I'm doing research in the Jewish community, but I do get a lot of questions about um, research in general. I'm very happy to talk to anybody about research. There's no charge. I enjoy talking research, giving advice. My website is nishmaresearch.com. That's N-I-S-H-M-A, which is a Hebrew word that means we listen. And as you can see, that's my my deal. Uh, My name is Mark Trencher, Mark with a K, M-A-R-K. So you can just email me at mark at nishmaresearch.com. And nishma research is one word, dot com. There's no H at the end of nishma. So uh, email me. I'd be happy to respond. I do try to respond to every email I get. Wow. Different types of research. And can you also provide a uh, some examples of how they're used? Sure, sure. Thank you. So I, I, I mentioned a few already. I mentioned the issue of awareness. That includes advertising awareness. Do people listen to my advertising? Do they remember it? You know, I mentioned the idea of developing new products, marketing them, selling them. Do you sell them to new customers or do you find existing customers or do you find new customers or existing customers? I mentioned the whole area of uh, customer satisfaction. There's a lot of other kinds of research. We talked about market size. The person who wanted to develop a new product, how big is the market? Uh, part of it is demographics. Who exactly are your customers? Age, income, maybe assets, if it might be a financial product. Uh, their education, do they have kids, older kids, younger kids, are they retired or working, just better understanding your customers and your potential customers. Uh, Location data is part of it. Um, I have a a business and I'm opening up a new location. Where should I go? Then you have to understand who lives in that area. How are you going to reach them? Uh, Finally, you know, shopping habits, communications habits. How do people like to shop uh, in the store, online, over the phone, through a catalog? web-based, communications habits. How do people like to be reached? Some people love getting texts. Other people don't like getting texts. Emails, phone calls. Some people say, don't call me, text me. So understanding how to reach your customers, people. Uh, And finally, data on competitors. So these are all different areas. There's a lot of different areas of market research in the business world. Um, Market research kind of means the business world, but not really. There's a lot of research It's sometimes called market research, sociological research. Uh, The research I do is in the Jewish community. That's communal research. I've done done, um, nine broad communal studies um, in the Jewish community. I've done studies of people, uh, the changes in their religious views over their lives. People become more observant, more religious or less. Uh, People uh, beliefs and practices, issues that are important. Uh, you know, how people uh, interact their Judaism with modern society. These are all really interesting questions. I should mention, I talked about the questions. Um, Every survey I do, I get together a group of people from the community and say, what do you want to know? Tell me the question. Mm -hmm. So the issue, the the process of coming up with questions is a very interactive one with with people in the community. Um, You know, Pew Research, there's a lot of studies. There's a lot of studies out there of people's uh, people's attitudes. You know, you mentioned, just like you mentioned, the, the COVID and vaccines. So we did a study on that. There's a lot of issues on that. Um, There's government research, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you need data on business in your area, the Small Business Administration, the Census Bureau. And of course, finally, one area that people sometimes are aware of more than anything else is all of those political polls. Who's ahead? Who's behind? I'll talk about that a little bit more because there are some problems with that. Um, but, But basically, research Every research has three basic steps. What, who, and how. What is what are you trying to find out? That's the questions. That's the questions. Sometimes people jump ahead and say, I want to do a survey on this, but they haven't stopped to ask the questions. Very important. Figure out the questions. What are you trying to find out? Then the who is, who are you focusing on? Are you focusing on your customers? 
Are you focusing on people in people out there that are not yet your customers, prospects? Are you focusing on people who have people who have been your customers in the past, and now you're concerned about retaining them, about returning right. to retaining right. them, Attention. or getting them back? Mm-hmm. So the first step is what? Second is who? The third step that a lot of people kind of kind of end up talking a lot about this is how are you going to get the answers you need? Because this gets a little bit technical. This is the research process. And I think if I give you a couple of examples, sure. I'll give you two examples of sure. projects I went through and they can illustrate, they can illustrate that. So, uh, but before I do that, I just want to say one, one quick story. Yeah. I was talking to a gentleman. He's a project manager for a mid-sized organization, has a lot of responsibilities. I happened to be sitting next to him at a wedding and he said to me, gee, you do research. You know, we need, we would love to do research. We, we've had like thousands of clients in the past that have gone through our program. It's an educational program. And we'd love to find out their reactions now, years later, what information are they retained, uh, their views about our organization. So I said to him, I said to him, you know, I could sense you're a very busy guy. I'm not going to send you a PowerPoint, which I usually do. I'm going to send you an email, just with some ideas. And he called me a week later. He said, Mark, I have to apologize. I am so busy, I haven't gotten to your email. And to be honest, I probably won't. <laughs> now, so so this, this tells me an important thing. Your average business does not have a director of research. There's nobody responsible for research. The owner is doing everything, everything under the sun. And the people reporting to that person are doing everything under the sun. You have to, give me, you have to get to be a pretty larger, mid-sized, larger-sized organization to have somebody in charge of research. So research often can fall to the wayside simply because of the fact that nobody really has the ownership of it, the responsibility. And this is, this is a reality. This is a reality. Right. So uh, I, I do recognize that. And that ties to my giving you my email address previously. I'm happy to advise people. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Somebody, a, a medium-sized business came to me and they had some data on their customer satisfaction but they wanted, to, they wanted to know a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So their basic question is what I talked about before, are their customers satisfied? So the first thing I'll tell you is, if you want to do research on customer satisfaction, if you Google customer satisfaction, the questions are already out there. You can find questions that have been tested by hundreds of companies, and you can even find data that when you do your survey and X percent say, well, you can even compare it to see how you stack up, which is really kind of interesting. Are the, are the, are the customers satisfied? So one of the examples, we ended up with this, with this business, we ended up doing something called Net Promoter Score. It's a very simple question, a very simple question. If, you're, you're, if somebody came to you and asked you for a recommendation for, let, let's say, a, 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 a school. Mm-hmm. Let, let's say this was a school. It wasn't a school. Let's say it's a school, an elementary school. If somebody came to you, uh, you're, you're a parent of one of our kids, and asked you for a recommendation, would, would you recommend us to, you, to, to this person? on a scale from one to 10. One being no, would not recommend at all. 10, absolutely, the school is fantastic. So the one thing that I found really interesting when I started using this is that people who say 10 or nine are called promoters. Wow, a 10 or nine is a very strong rating. They love, they, they love you. Eight and seven are what's called passive. You know, eight or seven, yeah, not bad. You might think you might think that people who rate you a five or six are kind of in between, but not really. If you get down below seven, those are called detractors. That, that's kind of some of those are kind of like pity ratings, I think. But um, interesting, uh, even they, even a number like seven, right? One would think that you know seven is kind of in the middle. Is better than a. I mean, yeah. it is better than a five, but still, you're saying once someone is in the six seven range, they they may be uh, yeah. in a business. They may be thinking of of right. leaving and going going right. to a competitor. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I do research in my retirement. I, I also will admit to the fact that I watch movies on Netflix. And if you know the movie ratings, if you know the Internet movie database ratings, if a movie is rated six, don't waste your time on it. Six is not good. S- good begins to come. Good begins to start at seven. So we ended up with this company. We ended up using the net promoter score. We ended up doing a survey. It's a very simple survey. How do you rate us from one to ten? And then whatever they say, why did you say that? Now, here's the important part. There's two important things. First of all, um, the survey had an open-ended question. So a lot of times there's a, a lot of times I get surveys one to ten, and that's the end of a survey. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not informative. You have to ask people why they said that. And unless you get like ten thousand responses, take the time to read through, segment them. Look at the people who said eight and seven. They're in the middle. Look at them. 
And why do they rate that? That gives you, those are a huge, huge opportunity. The opportunity to take those passives and make them promoters. And then you look at the people who rated you at like seven, six, five, four, three, and you really need to read through those because those are the people that are probably got, not going to come back to your business and you want to attract them. This first example is called quantitative. It's a survey. Quantitative is any kind of research that generates data, numbers. And you want to generate a number for satisfaction because you really want to do it quarterly or every year. You want to track it. A, you want to track it. And also you can compare yourself to others out there, to, to, to the world of net promoter scores. So that's called quantitative survey. Research breaks down into two groups. One is called quantitative, that generates numbers, statistics. And the other is, which I'll give an example right now of the other group, of the other um, product, of the other type of research. So I was approached by an insurance agent mm -hmm. and he said to me, you know, I'm reading in the paper about all these, all these hacks. Businesses get hacked, their data gets stolen, emails get stolen. What happens? I said, you know, what happens is they can get sued. A, they have to spend thousands of, or maybe millions of dollars to fix it. They got to notify everybody and they can get sued. He says, is there any kind of insurance? I said, funny you should ask me whether there's any kind of insurance. There actually is. The insurance companies are actually trying to uh, sell data breach coverage, which mm -hmm. is a coverage that a small business owner or a mid-size would buy to, um, to to cover them if this happens. Right. So, so this agent was very curious about, about the market for this. And so if this was a research project, the what would be um, approaching his customers, an insurance agent, saying, first of all, I would even advise him, don't, don't call your customers and say, are you concerned about your data? Say, it's, an, it's a real opportunity. Research can be an opportunity to connect. How are you doing? Uh, are you happy with your coverages? Are there any coverages that you're, that you're missing? They might volunteer the fact that they've been thinking about their data. Their data. Are you concerned about data breaches? Uh, in terms, so that's the what. The who is, the who is a new sale to existing customers. This is an opportunity had to add a coverage to existing customers but also to find new customers who are particularly interested in this. Now, I'm mentioning this as the second example because in this case, I think a qualitative approach is more beneficial. Remember, quantitative was a survey, whether it's a telephone survey or an online survey or an email survey or a web-based, it's a survey that generates numbers because you're measuring satisfaction and you wanna be able to track it over time. This is gonna be more qualitative. I think for a new product, it's kind, of, it's kind of iffy to kind of say, you know, X percent are interested in this new product. They probably don't really even understand it fully, but it's really an opportunity to talk to people. And whether you get six of your clients to get, in the old days, we had focus groups where we had 12 people in a room, you give them sandwiches and soda, you give them some <laughs> money, they talk for two hours. And nowadays, along came Zoom, and, and the same thing can be done wow. online where people talk to each other, they learn from each other, they talk about the product. Um, and it, it, this is called qualitative research. Just research, qualitative research is really just having a conversation. Quantitative has a survey with questions. Qualitative has what's called a discussion guide, which looks like questions, but it's really a, a guide for the moderator, the person who's leading it to talk to people, to talk to people. And a survey is fixed, but a qualitative research, you can kind of deviate this way and that way, and uh, you can go off on tangents. So those are the two different kinds of research is quantitative and qualitative. Now, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what you touched on, political polling, and <laughs> why, I mean, kind of the world has seen how unreliable it is in general, in general. Um, certainly over the last few uh, presidential elections, it's uh, has not exactly been accurate. Although some, you know, if you get granular, sometimes you do see that there, uh, there, there, there was information in there which was quite telling. Um, before we go to a break, how could people find out about your firm? So my website is uh, nishmaresearch.com. That's nishma, N-I-S-H-M-A, research.com. Uh, and it does have a, it does have, there's a contact me uh, uh, link where you can click on it and send me an email. And I do try to respond to all emails. Now, I have to just share a story that uh, in terms of the power of a great, of great polling and great research, uh, our firm was involved in the campaign to elect uh, Bob Turner. This goes back around a decade ago in 2011. There was a special election 
And uh, at the time, John McLaughlin was doing uh, John McLaughlin was doing his polling, and he 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 did a poll on the race, sent it to us, and then I I remember telling my team, I said, I have all the ammunition I need, uh, and and there was no question that that polling, the information that it yielded and that it shared with us gave us the gave us a tremendous edge i kind of like knew exactly we were able to crawl into people's minds know exactly where they are and what what to be able to discuss what what should be the conversation the narrative that we should build out there for our candidate in order to try to get him elected and even though he was a uh he was the the odds the odds out there were a one to four Odds. I mean, it was it was a district that had been Democratic since the early 1900s, and to get a Republican in there was like the odds were heavily stacked against us, and we wound up pulling off a, a great W, a, a victory in that race. And I remember telling friends, I said, "There's no question that the research that I had, which then drove the 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 packaging of the narrative that we prepared for our client, was because of the research that we had." Now, with that, now, Mark, I turn it to you. I mean, in the recent presidential elections and many elections, the, the, the numbers, the, the data that the papers and that the main media sources were giving out there didn't always turn out to be correct. So perhaps you could ex- explain what political polling is and what happened over the last, I don't know, five, ten years where their numbers are not always so accurate. Okay, so political polling is mainly uh, surveys. Uh, we hear all the survey results. I should tell you that there are a lot of focus groups out there uh, of voters. And every now and then I hear a message, an ad, and I listen to the wording of the ad and I say, yeah, ah, that emerged from a focus group where somebody said something. And you can kind of hear it. But <laughs> basically the political polling says a few important things. Number one, the gold standard of surveys, telephone surveys, is gone. People don't answer their phone. People don't have landlines. People screen their messages. How do you reach people? That's a challenge. Um, Number two, uh, in terms of political polling, bigger is worse, which by which I mean that national, because of the electoral college and because of the fact that we have 12 swing states, um, you know, a state, if you're accurate within plus or minus 2% in Arizona and Florida, Georgia, you could easily blow the entire election just from these three states. So the nature of the Electoral College makes it more difficult. Uh, the, the interesting lesson that I learned was, go back to 2016, everyone talked about the shy Trump voter. What was the shy Trump voter? The shy Trump voter was a person who got a phone call, because we, we there were still phone surveys, and who do you vote for? Well, I don't know. They wanted to vote for Donald Trump, but they didn't want to say it because he was kind of a different candidate. He wasn't a typical candidate. And the theory was that people were shy and they wouldn't admit it. In my view, the shy, and we've now learned this is true, the shy Trump voter is a shy voter. There's really no such thing as, as a shy Trump voter. There is a, a person who doesn't want to be bothered. There are people in this country, whether you're talking about soap or deodorants or technology or who you're going to vote for, they don't want to be bothered. They don't answer the phone. They're screening. They don't answer. To me, the challenge is around representativeness. When you have your survey of 1,500 people, you can talk about plus or minus 3% accurate all you want. But if those 1,500 are not representative of the group you're surveying of the public, that's the problem. So to me, the main problem I learned in the recent election polling was that issue of the challenge of getting representative, of getting those people who are not really interested in talking to you. You know, Mark, you had mentioned about the uh, that, that people are just not interested in talking anymore. And, and you know, just an interesting anecdotal. Uh, I Maybe I heard this from you, actually. I remember hearing a story about a uh, company that wanted information uh, from the Jewish community. and But the, the information that was coming back was just not accurate. And the company realized it. And they said, when are... Or, Again, I don't recall exactly where I heard this information, but I remember hearing this case that they had done their polling. They had done their their you know the uh, the calls to, uh, their their polling on Friday nights. 
So, <laughs> and they were wondering why they weren't getting any accurate information from the Orthodox Jewish community. <laughs> well, no one picked up the phone, obviously. It's Friday night. But the company or the campaign just didn't realize it. And meanwhile, it seems that that was a natural time to do it for the general market, but not for the general right, market. Right. So you have to always right, know right. your market. And I guess that kind of leads in to, an, um, you know, just to a question, the importance of understanding your demographic. I imagine whenever you're doing any type of research project, you have to know what media they consume, what's the best way to get through to them, how will, what will make them respond. In fact, we saw that in the, can in the research you did for Atsala. I mean, you had... You, 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 I, I, I was fascinated by by the reach that that you were able to have. the The amount of respondents was without offering them some type of prize or gimmick. You, you had you had real engagement. Perhaps you could even share right. some 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 I, perhaps secrets on 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 how to on how to present right. in a way that's engaging that you'll get people to uh, engage and respond to a survey. So, so I've heard it said. I've heard it said that why would people respond to a survey? There are two reasons. Number one, uh, it's a to it's something that interests it. It interests them. The topic interests them, and two, it's kind of it doesn't look too hard to do. So we try to make our surveys easy. We put them online. Uh, I know that in the case of coronavirus and COVID and the vaccines, everyone was interested in it. Uh, in the case in in the situation in the survey we did where we actually surveyed uh, the entire spectrum of the Orthodox Jewish community, mm -hmm. the challenge was really reaching the Hasidic groups because these people are harder to reach. They don't have uh, emails or web access the way that, uh, that the modern Orthodox, for example, have. Uh, the two things that made that survey successful were uh, the name of Hatzala, an organization that has, we mentioned Net Promoter Score. Yeah. Hatzala has a Net Promoter Score, which is the, 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 the positive view higher than I've ever seen any company yeah. in any survey. So they're respected. Yeah. They're respected. They certainly deserve um, it. Yeah. I, I will note, though, that it was, I'll, I'll give one example, and that is that among some groups, so among the Hasidic groups, we did have many more men than women respond. And that's understandable because they don't, these people may not have internet access at home, but so they, they might have responded at the workplace. So sometimes you do a survey and you get the, a non-representative response where you're getting more of upper income, more of lower income, more of educated. In this case, you got more men than women. Uh, but if you understand why, there are mathematical ways to do weighting to adjust for that. So uh, in this case, we, we actually did that. Um, let's move on to... We're all anyone that orders a product from Amazon or someone goes like you mentioned, they go to a doctor. You get these surveys, and of course, we know about this Yelp and Google, etc. Uh, uh, are surveys like that considered market research? Are they accurate? Well, they, they, they might be if they're run by a, a business. A business, if a business is doing it and asking for your opinion, my hope is that they would read the that they read the responses. I always get very disappointed when there's no opportunity to type in why am I saying this when they just ask for the rating and that's the end of the survey. You know, my concerns are one, uh, the quality of the data. So we all know that we, we all know that some of the ratings on Amazon are biased. Uh, that's why an organization like Fake Spot emerged, which tells you not what the rating is, but they look at the ratings and say we think that 10% of the ratings are not are, are fake. Mm -hmm. um, some of the surveys, some sometimes the uh, Surveys are poorly designed, but they still could be market research. Um, but in general, in general, uh, one of the problems in the research world is there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't really research that's smart that pretends to be research. So a, in a phone call, we're doing a survey. No, they're not doing a phone. They're, they're not doing a survey. It's a recruitment call or a marketing call. So to me, ultimately, that kind of gives research a bad name. So that's that's you know, some of this is research. Some is not, but there's just too much of it these days. Yeah. I know in the political world, we know there's something called a push poll. <laughs> and like you said, that's basically to try to subtly convince mm -hmm. uh, the you know the person that you're calling about the candidate. And of course, it's presented in a way of, of research, but at the end of the day, it's really it's really a push poll, and which of right. course is just really trying to convince someone of something. I want to remind the listeners, tonight's show with Mark Trencher talking all about the world of research will also turn into a YouTube episode. 
uh, if you subscribe to our channel, you are, you'll automatically be notified when it gets posted. Um, we're at 710WOR Mind Your Business on YouTube. Again, on YouTube at 710WOR Mind Your Business. Click, click subscribe and you're automatically notified every single time a show goes live. Well, before the break, I mentioned that we're going to talk about uh, how the world of research applies to businesses, whether it's a B2C, that's business to consumer, B2B, whether it's they're in vis- a company or an, a, a person that has an idea and they want to pres- they, they, they want to just know, is there a market for their idea? Or if it's uh, a company that wants to get funding for developing a product. I know it's kind of a very big open question, but if there's one person to answer it, it's Mark Trencher. So, Mark, I'll hand it to you with that uh, biggie. Thank you. Thank you. So, actually, I recently had an example that is very similar to what you're describing. Uh, I got a phone call from a gentleman, um, and he said he had a concept. He had a concept for an educational product involving technology, uh, very different from what's out there currently in an early stage. And he wanted to develop a business plan. And the first thing he wanted to, to develop an understanding of is um, how big is the market? How big is the market? So in this case, I, I, I discussed this with him. He said, yes, he is developing a business plan. It sounded like he was looking for funding. We didn't get into that much. I, that's not my area of expertise. But obviously developing a business plan where you have projections that this is a product that has a, a, a market in the U.S. of uh, of 500,000 families and Canada and other countries um, and and developing pricing. Uh, these are all numbers that can be very valuable in a business plan in getting investors. But we started with the question of what is the potential market size? And in the area of, of market size, um, you there's often a lot of data available. So for this product, we, decided, we looked at people, uh, families with children. All these numbers are available from the Census Bureau. Uh, the distribution of children in preschool, how many are in kindergarten. We looked at grades one through eight and high school because the product would be a little bit different depending on the ages. Um, he was, we started with the New York, greater New York area. We had access to some surveys that have been done. So a lot of it was just looking into what we call secondary research. Now, secondary research is a term I haven't used before, but research is also divided into primary, which is a survey you do, new data, no one else has it, you have it, you own it, you can give it away if you want, you don't have to. And secondary, secondary is there's a lot of stuff out there and hey, why don't we draw on it? And it might you might need to get your Microsoft Excel spreadsheet together and plunk numbers into it. You probably will need to make some assumptions, but you lay out the assumptions clearly in your business plan. So what I ended up giving him was um, the number by age, uh, by, by several countries, uh, where they were in school. Uh, also, was, we gave them some demographic data on their families, but all this data was available uh, for him. And he end, I think he ended up being pleased at the size of the market. It was a reasonable size market. And so at that point, it becomes a go, no-go decision. Are we going to pursue this? And he did share with me that the next step in this research which we have not, I, I haven't heard from him, so I don't know that we've done this yet, but his next step is going to be to actually get, get reactions from this market to his product concept. So he had a concept, and now he has some numbers for a business plan. Uh, now he has some numbers that he can share with possible investors, and he has an idea for a product. He wants to fine tune the idea, maybe have a prototype. And so the next step would be qualitative research. It could be interviews. It doesn't have to be hundreds of them. It could be it could be two group interviews, two or three or four group interviews over Zoom with eight or ten people. It could be uh, 24 or so. I've done studies with, where I've had 24 10-minute telephone interviews. We record them. We analyze them. So the next step then would be product reactions. Um, he, he might have images of his product to show people over Zoom. So this is a two-step. This is business to computer, business to consumer, B2C. And it involves the, it gives him information that covers the entire spectrum of what he would need for a full fledged business plan, size of market, demographics of the potential clients, and also some real information on the products themselves. So this is an example of just a, of a new business of a person who seemed to be very in tune with research. He's going to pursue the research. I wish him well. 
And I'm glad to have been able to help him, at least in phase one. Now, I mean, by default, one would think that it's much more important for a B to C type of business to do the research. But B to B, I mean, obviously, they they're they're it, it's it's a more much more in general limited uh, window, a, a limited world. But is it fair to say that B two B also should uh, be looking at research uh, from their Absol- customers? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So many many years ago, I worked for a large uh, financial company uh, that was selling um, retirement products, four hundred one ks, investment, uh, the plans, the administration, and we did a major project that was both B two B and B two C. B two C would be into it was uh, I seem to recall about five hundred interviews with individuals, are you saving for your retirement? Where? Individual account. Is it through your is it through your employer? Where do you put the money? How do you decide where to put the money? How do you how do you decide how much to invest? Et cetera, et cetera. The the B2C was completely different. Are you offering this to your employees? And we did a couple of dozen interviews. Are you offering these options? Here are some options for new investment options that we've developed is this something you'd be? Is this something you'd be interested in offering to your employees? So that that was the B two B. So there are actually some projects that have both B two B and B two C. Uh, clearly, they are both important. Uh, I think uh, I think there probably is more consumer research done than business research these days, but that might be because a lot of the consumer research gets publicized and gets made publicly available. Whereas a B two B project, you might never hear of it because it's really very often proprietary. But both are very important. Now, Mark, before I get to my last question, we have only around three minutes left. How could people get in touch with you and find out more about your work? Okay, so my website is uh, nishmaresearch.com, N-I-S-H-M-A research.com. You can read about some of the research I've done. That's in the Jewish community. Um, uh, and there's a link to my to contact me. I'm happy to respond to any, to any emails. Uh, much of what I've done, most of what I've done over my career has been in the business world. So don't let the fact that my re- that my website is Jewish Community Research uh, sway you into not contacting me. If you have a question about research, feel free to reach out. Mark, just as a uh, final, what what perhaps you could share a final uh, tip or advice to small businesses that are considering or haven't really even during the entire show they don't they're not convinced yet the importance of research. Perhaps you could just share a final thought on that. Yeah, so the final thought I have is if, you, if you're if you thinking about research, get your team together, get your group together and say, you know what, I'm thinking about research, but really I'm, we're here today for something else. That is, I want to ask you to think about what are the questions that are on your mind that if we did research would be worth asking. Mm-hmm. Think through the questions. You will whet people's appetites. You'll get a process going. People will say, gee, I'd really love to know that. Would you be interested in working on the project to get at that? Absolutely. So that's really a good way to get to get the research process going. Finally, research is fun. You'll learn things you didn't know. You'll, you'll think about how to use them. You get some creative juices going. And I think you can have a lot of fun doing research. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and be notified every single time a new video goes live. Don't miss out on any of the weekly interviews that I have with top business leaders, sometimes Fortune 500 executives. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications.